Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans, and I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Jill Robbins and Brian Lynn. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, the Roman Catholic religious community in Belgium, known as Grimbergen Abbey, says it will start making beer again after more than two hundred years. The clergy in Grimbergen have started a small brewery making the alcoholic drinks that carry the abbey's name. The abbey's emblem is a phoenix, along with a Latin language saying, "Ardeit nec consumiter." That means burned, but not destroyed. The abbey was burned down and destroyed twice by French troops during the French Revolution in 1798. Carlos Stathamas is a clergyman at the abbey and is studying beer making. He said beer making was a second life for Belgian abbeys. He said the community of fifteen Norbertine canons. A religious order of the Roman Catholic Church is pleased about the beer's return. Stathimas explained that religion was the main activity of the community, but brewing was necessary because water at the moment in the Middle Ages wasn't drinkable, and also it was a kind of payment. The abbey was founded in 1128. And has had ties to large beer companies since 1958. Denmark's Carlsberg, a drink-making company, now owns the sales rights to the Abbey's beer. The new brewery aims to combine 900 years of beer making with modern methods. To celebrate the recent opening, the Abbey is releasing three new Grimbergen beers. Mark Anton Sochon is a beer expert from Carlsberg who is helping create the new beers. He said one of the beers uses a method from the Middle Ages of smoking the malt mixture. That's the idea, I think, to make trials, experiments, and try new things. He said. The brewery also aims to use local plants. The abbey has planted hops and herbs in its garden, where they discovered an old cow bone used to make beer. Grimbergen's members will follow the rules of Belgium's Trappist beer makers, another Catholic order. The rules require them to make the beer within the abbey and control the operation. They will also use any profits to care for the abbey and for charitable causes. Naomi Osaka received the support of tennis fans, leading athletes. Her sponsors and her country, Japan, Tuesday after her withdrawal from the French Open. The world's number two female tennis player surprised the tennis world on Monday when she said she would no longer play in the tennis championship. Osaka said on Twitter that she experiences huge waves of anxiety before speaking to the media. And. She has suffered long bouts of depression since the U.S. Open in 2018. The decision came after Osaka was fined fifteen thousand dollars for not attending a press conference after her first round victory. She was also threatened by the French Open and other major championships with more punishment, including suspension. 
Osaka said she did not want to meet with the media to protect her mental health. Other leading tennis players argued at the time that dealing with the media was part of the job. But when she withdrew, there were many messages of support from around the world. The head of Japan Tennis Association said in a statement Tuesday, I wish her the earliest possible recovery. And Japan's chief cabinet secretary, Katsunobu Kato, told reporters that he would watch over her quietly. There was also concern on the streets of Tokyo for Osaka, who will represent Japan in this year's Olympic Games. Tomomi Noguchi helps people wear the traditional Japanese clothing, a kimono, for photos and events. I think she's under a lot of pressure, more than we can imagine, she told Reuters. She got to the top when she was young, so I think we can't really imagine what she's going through. The sports business website Sportico says Osaka has made more than $55 million in the last 12 months, mainly from deals with sponsors like Nissin Foods, Nike, and MasterCard. They all came out to support her decision. And Nissan, the automobile company, said, We stand by her decision and wish her well. Osaka was an unknown when she won the 2018 U.S. Open Championship over American Serena Williams. The crowd was upset with officials' calls against Williams, so they expressed their displeasure against officials instead of cheering for the new champion. On Monday, Williams added her support for Osaka, saying, I feel for Naomi. I feel like I wish I could give her a hug, because I know what it's like. You just have to let her handle it the way she wants to, in the best way she thinks she can. There were also messages of support from other female tennis champions and athletes, including Olympic champion Mo Farah and NBA player Stephen Curry. Six times major champion Boris Becker, however, was worried Osaka's tennis career could be in danger because of mental health issues. He told Eurosport, if she can't cope with the media in Paris, she can't cope with the media in Wimbledon or the U.S. Open. So I almost feel like her career is in danger due to mental health issues. I'm Jill Robbins. China's government has raised the child limit for couples from two to three as the country experiences lower birth rates. For many years, China enforced a one-child policy as a way to control the population. But that policy was replaced in 2016 with a two-child limit. That change was aimed at raising the number of births as the country faced a fast aging population. But birth rates have further decreased in recent years as the cost of raising children in Chinese cities remains high. The latest measure to permit three children per family is meant to actively deal with the aging population, the official Xinhua News Agency reported. The decision came during a ruling Communist Party meeting led by President Xi Jinping, it said. The policy includes what the government calls supportive measures to make it easier for families to have more children. The measures include plans to lower educational costs for families and increase tax and housing support. 
The government also said it would seek to educate young people on marriage and love. Recent data showed that China's fertility rate, the average number of births per mother, was 1.3 in 2020. That rate, which is similar to aging nations like Japan and Italy, is well short of the 2.1 needed to replace the population. Yifei Li is a sociologist at New York University, Shanghai. She told Reuters that most families did not hold back on having children in recent years because of the government's two-child policy. Instead, she said they held off because of the incredibly high costs of raising children in today's China. Zhang Xingyu is a 30-year-old mother of one from Zhengzhou in northeastern China. She said another problem was that women carried most of the responsibility for raising children. She added, "I don't want to have a second child, and a third is even more impossible." Economists say that China, along with Thailand and some other Asian economies, faces concerns. That it could grow old before it gets wealthy. The Chinese population of 1.4 billion was already expected to reach a high later this decade, before starting to drop. But recent government data suggested that is happening faster than expected. Experts say this adds to pressures. On underfinanced retirement and health systems, and cuts the number of future workers available to support a growing retiree group. The share of China's working-age people, 15 to 59, fell to 63.3 percent last year, from 70 percent a decade earlier. The group aged 65 and older grew to 13.5 percent from nearly 9 percent. The country's reported 12 million births last year was down nearly one fifth from 2019. I'm Brian Lin. When visitors enter Planet Word, a new museum in Washington D.C., they will see Speaking Willow, a tall art piece representing a tree. As they pass under the artwork, they can hear recordings of speech in hundreds of languages coming from the tree. Most words sound foreign to the listeners. The different voices also speak at the same time. The resulting noise. Is similar to that made in a crowded theater before a show begins. <laughs> Rafael Lozano Hemmer completed the piece last year. On his website, the artist says that speaking willow reminds us that language is what defines. Our specific communities, and connects our many cultures. Lozano Hemmer made the piece specially for the museum. It is the first of many immersive experiences for visitors at Planet Word, a museum all about words and language. The exhibits playfully explore the large and complex subject of language. Anne Friedman is Planet Word's founder and director. How do you make an abstract concept like words and language come to life without objects that you can touch and see and feel? You have to have immersive, participatory experiences that 
you will remember forever because they're unique, exciting, and social. In one room, a video plays showing babies saying their first words. Another room, called Where Do Words Come From, teaches the history of some common English words. The space includes a 22-foot-tall wall of words, where visitors speak into devices and learn about the roots of the English language. We're standing in front of about 1,000 words, and that's not even 1% of the entire English language. Um, where did they come from? That exhibit took two years to build, Friedman said, noting the time used for creation of software and sound design. The exhibit's creators began the project with 28 English words they wanted to explain. They narrowed that list down to the most fun and interesting words. Arachnid was one of the words that made it into the exhibit. It is the scientific word for spiders, among other creatures. Another room invites listeners to speak and learn about different languages. Native speakers of 28 languages and two sign languages teach people sayings in those languages. They also explain how language shapes their understanding of the world and how words cannot be separated from culture. For example, a Japanese language presenter discussed how politeness is very important to Japanese culture. The language has several words to choose from in addressing another person. The words speak to the nature of the relationship between the speaker and listener. The Quechua people are natives of Peru. They understand the idea of time in a singular way. The Quechua speaker explained that since the future cannot be seen, it is behind us. The past, however, is ahead of us where we can see it. Other rooms explore the different ways language is used, from humor and songwriting to public speaking and advertising. Visitors can sing karaoke while learning about songwriting, record a famous speech, play a joke-telling game, and teach a computer how to make cartoons. Almost every exhibit is interactive, and most ask visitors to speak aloud. Caitlin Miller is Planet Word's education director. You get better at reading by reading, Miller said. You become a more confident speaker by speaking and listening. One exhibit room is all about books. It is designed to look like an old, rich library. Books line the shelves. When a book is placed on the table, a recorded reading begins and pictures appear. But Shady Creek isn't exactly a progressive paradise. Planet Word is housed in Washington's historic Franklin School. The D.C. government gave limited control of the property to Friedman in 2017. She has spent $35 million on the building and the museum. Friedman is a former reading and writing teacher. She wanted to create a museum to build interest and curiosity in writing and language. The museum is designed mainly for teenagers, but most adults can also learn from and enjoy a visit to Planet Word. Friedman hopes people will leave the museum with a better understanding of the words they use every day and the world of languages around them. And in a globalizing world, we think that's a pretty important characteristic. I'm Jill Robbins. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today, we are talking about Thomas Jefferson. Although he took office in 1801, he is still one of the country's best-known and most popular presidents. You can see a memorial honoring him in Washington, D.C. 
Jefferson is often linked to the country's history of self-government, separation of church and state, and public education. Over time, Jefferson's name also became linked to the continuation of slavery until the Civil War and to the loss of land for Native Americans. Jefferson was born in 1743 and grew up in the hills and low mountains of Virginia. His family's wealth enabled him to get an excellent education. Jefferson also learned to ride horses, dance, and explore the natural world. In the 1770s, Jefferson supported the American Revolution against Britain. He is probably most famous for being the lead writer of the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson went on to hold many positions in the country's new state and national governments. He served as governor of Virginia, a minister to France, secretary of state for President George Washington, and the vice president under President John Adams. Jefferson played an important part in the creation of the U.S., but he often wrote to friends about how he most wanted to retire from public service and return to his home in Virginia. In the 1760s, he designed a house there that he called Monticello. The word means little mountain in Italian. About 130 slaves lived on Monticello's grounds at any time. They worked in Jefferson's home, farms, and on special projects, such as making cabinets and nails. Jefferson owned about 600 slaves during his life, yet he said he disliked slavery. He believed God would judge slave owners severely. And, of course, Jefferson himself wrote in the Declaration of Independence, All men are created equal and have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet, Jefferson did not use his political power to end slavery. He expected future generations would permit slavery to end slowly across the country. Jefferson's words and actions on slavery are contradictory. This conflict is especially evident because Jefferson likely had a long relationship with a slave at Monticello. Her name was Sally Hemings. Evidence suggests that Jefferson was the father of her six children of record. In 1801, Thomas Jefferson left Monticello to become the third U.S. president. His inauguration was the first held in Washington, D.C. Jefferson's government was a break from the earlier administrations. The first two presidents, George Washington and John Adams, supported a strong federal government. Jefferson, on the other hand, wanted to limit federal government. As president, Jefferson cut the national debt. He reduced the military. He disliked the power of the Supreme Court over the laws Congress made. And he rejected appearances that made the U.S. president look like a European king. One of the lasting images of Jefferson is of him receiving guests in old clothes and slippers. But as president, Jefferson also appeared strong and powerful when dealing with foreign nations. Jefferson increased American naval forces in the Mediterranean to guard against threats to American ships. And he permitted U.S. officials to buy a huge piece of land from France. Even though the Louisiana Purchase added to the national debt and exceeded the power the Constitution gave the president. 
In general, historians consider Jefferson's first term as president a success. Voters did, too, because he easily won a second term. But those last four years were difficult. Jefferson's popularity suffered, especially when he stopped all American trade with Europe. Jefferson aimed to limit U.S. involvement in a war between Britain and France. Instead, critics say he ruined the American economy. Critics also attacked both Jefferson's political ideas and his personal qualities. George Washington worried that Jefferson would weaken the strong federal government he had worked hard to create. And even friends suggested in their letters that Jefferson was too idealistic. Jefferson's opponents also accused him of not being a Christian, although he said he was. However, he did not believe the government should make rules about religion. He wrote that the government should worry only about acts that hurt other people. He said, It does not harm him if his neighbor says there are twenty gods or no gods. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Jefferson's thinking on the separation of church and state remains important and, in general, popular in the U.S. today. However, Jefferson is linked to problems faced by Native Americans. He tried to get Indian nations to enter into treaties that ultimately took away their land. He wanted Native Americans to become more like European Americans. His policies made them depend on the federal government. And Jefferson took no major action to end slavery, either in his personal life or as a public official. At the end of his life, Jefferson wrote proudly about his accomplishments. He said he wanted to be remembered for three things, writing the Declaration of Independence, supporting religious freedom, and creating the University of Virginia. For the most part, he is. Jefferson also supported free public education, especially for those who could not pay for school. But his time at Monticello had many sorrows. His wife, Martha, had died in 1782 after difficulty in childbirth. Most of his children also died before him. In addition, the cost of improving and caring for Monticello, as well as the money he spent on fine wine and good food, had ruined him financially. Eventually, one of his daughters had to sell her father's beloved Monticello and the slaves who lived there to pay his debts. Jefferson died in his bed at the age of 83. The last detail of his life, which Americans love to tell, is that he died on America's birthday, exactly 50 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 